Um, first sort of began more in, in, let's say, academic culture in the mid-90s, I think, when you were a student, when I was... Um, I was a child. You were a kid. <laughs> um, and I was one of the first early adopters, along with some other American architects, of basically working um, in, a, in a digital environment. And it wasn't really completely seamless at that time. And actually, people weren't building projects with it. There wasn't, you know, uh, project delivery. It was about basically... Um, new types of surfaces and new possibilities in architecture. And when, I think, say from 2000, uh, five, six years later, when people who, who had commissions, let's say like Gary or, or Herzog, uh, building projects like Disney Hall or um, The Bird's Nest, I think um, I characterize the sort of last 10 or 12 years of working with digital technology as a just do it period, we're gonna ask all the questions later. Let's go build it, let's see what happens, and um, we can inspect the buildings for the level of craft. We can inspect the buildings for what they did to advancing culture. And that's, to me, one of the interesting um, thoughts about digital technology is it's accessible and ubiquitous and everybody has it, but then like all technology, what you do with it is really probably even more important than just, you know, whether you have or don't have access to it. So... Yeah, I, th I think uh, one of the most important thing that I feel how this thing evolved is uh, early on when you had very few trades actually putting together a building or infrastructure, as today you, you would see that projects have become very complex. There's so many different trades who have actually come together to put a facility like this. And uh, being so complex, it becomes very important that you understand what's uh, going into each aspect of the design and uh, how it is constructed. And I think 3D makes sense to actually be able to understand that aspect. And I think it's becoming more and more important that um, 3D is actually seen as a, a common platform for design and construction. Uh, in uh, uh, our fraternity, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with both of those points. I think the, you know, if there's a two different aspects of 3D technology, one is uh, the form that I think Neil was referring to in what especially the early adopters were really using the computer for, for novel forms. And I think as software and technology has gotten more robust, our access to new formal languages has become equally as robust. So in that sense, it's an incredibly exciting time to be an architect because we're dealing with technologies that allow us to use languages we've never before had access to. So there's that part of it, which is the computer is a formal tool. I would say the second part of that, and one that I'm particularly interested in is the use of the computer and a 3D file format as uh, an interdisciplinary tool to move seamlessly between disciplines. So I was just, I just had an interview with uh, Surface Magazine th this morning and I was describing how, you know, we live in a world where I, I had worked on an, uh, an outfit with Nicola Formichetti for Lady Gaga and he asked me how to do something and I contacted Autodesk and their special effects division at Mudbox to help me build something that was 3D printed in Toronto and sent back to New York and part of this video. So we're moving from like special effects into architecture, into fashion in this really fluid way and it was all done because we could trade these file formats between our different disciplines and our different uh, technologies. So I think there's that, I call it kind of the Rosetta Stone aspect of 3D technology now that it's allowing us to incorporate different disciplines and different attitudes towards uh, architecture and architectural form that even even makes what we're doing with the formal project of architecture larger and more sophisticated. So there's really you know a wealth of innovation on the table in terms of technology and 3D technology in particular. And I think we're going to see a generation uh, like you know Neil's a, a part of that's actually building this stuff and like seeing how it plays out in the world. And I think it's a long I think it's a long project in architecture. I don't think it's like a decade project. I think it's like a century long project. And if you look around, you see evidence of these things uh, popping up in different places around the world. And that's, you know, it's incredible 
not just that it's happening, but it's incredible to come together at times like this and see how these technologies are trickling into different places around the world and impacting architects from small to large, from you know New Delhi to Singapore and New York and everywhere in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the early time frame when software became available, architects were then exploring it to see what they could do with it. So in a way, architects were sort of behind the curve on technology. We've mastered a lot of things, and now architects are more demanding, I think, of industry because we want to do more because we know that there's possibilities, as Mark talked about. So in many respects, I think issues for the future are about proprietary conditions, customization, how can a particular office actually um, create uh, their own type of shortcuts, their own types of ways in which they can uh, work more effectively. Um, literally a kind of tailoring of all of this, which obviously in the beginning, uh, certain types of products didn't do things that you wanted it to, and you know there were certain types of limits. For instance, I started out using Soft Image, which was a, a, a French uh, company Basically, it was used in Hollywood for animation, but you couldn't import or export 2D out of it. And we could only work in the 3D environment, and, and uh, that was a certain kind of progress, but it was also not friendly to architects. So uh, I think at this point, um, architects are actually demanding things rather than just simply saying, well, what's out there and what can we or do? If we want to make changes to it, we're going to keep doing them over and over again. So the iterative aspect, um, of architecture, which used to be slow, is now fast um, for even a smaller team to be able to run through um, different strategies and possibilities with clients, both you know the clients as well as in the office. So it, it's not so much that 3D technology and technology itself sort of saves time. It actually creates more work. Mm -hmm. um, it, let's say it creates a stockpile of possibilities that you still have to make intellectual judgments on. And for me, that's an interesting thing about the field right now. Um, is digital technology uh, asking clients and cities to have architects be more spectacular? Or do architects just want to do it on their own? Or is it a kind of a combination of both? Um, that, for me, is pretty fascinating, especially when I look out at a city like Singapore, which is sort of thinking about what the next step is for branding and urban identity and so forth, and it's completely contingent on digital technology, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yep. Yeah, that's also an interesting professional question. I, I, I was just flipping through the book uh, from the 1980 uh, uh, convention called the Charlottesville Tapes that had you know, like a very young Rem Koolhaas, uh, Toyo Ito, Robert Amstern, Michael Graves, Peter Eisenman, and I was flipping through it, and I was, uh, it, it's kind of astounding at how unbelievably simple all the drawings look. You know, these are guys at the forefront of their profession in yeah. 1980, yeah. and they're coming up with drawings which look like a sixth grader produced them. <laughs> because my eye is used to seeing architecture with a thousand times more complexity in an image, you know. So I'm used to seeing shadows and materials and photorealistic and mm -hmm. lens flare and skateboarders and, you know, all the r unbelievable things we put in our renderings now. But that question of abstraction is so interesting because it, 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 it's a professional question because our, and maybe this is beyond the confines of this, but it's something I come up ag with against in my office, is that I also have clients that they want, I have a, a handful of clients in the fashion industry and they want to know exactly what it looks like uh, now, know, now, right? So, whereas in the past, I could get by with you know a little design sketch, and and you know still bill for a creative design fee. Now I'm expected to do mm -hmm. a total photorealistic 3D rendering that takes someone in my office a week to do, whereas I used to be able to get by with a little sketch. So where does the, where do those hours come from, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. How are we how are we changing the profession to uh, uh, match the quality of what we're putting out there. Because well, we can no longer do something with like four lines on a T-square and you know two vertical lines and a 30-degree mm -hmm. angle, which is, you know, Remco has this thing in the Charlottesville tape, is literally mm -hmm. like eight lines with a little McDonald's sign, and it was, mm -hmm. they could talk about it for hours. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. now I wouldn't even, it wouldn't even, if I saw it in this wall, I'd, you know, 
tear it down mm -hmm. for being so unbelievably bad. Mm -hmm. No, architecture <laughs> has to contend with expectation and the kind of quicksilver nature of all media. Architecture, it could be debatable as to whether or not it's a media because it sounds uh, ultra commercial, it sounds ultra ephemeral, um, uh, negative. Uh, yet at the same time, it's also still a form of production and communication that is now working within the same world where ephemerality and speed, which are the you know the the mandates of let's say fashion or or uh, the blogosphere or something like mm -hmm. that. I mean, I think there's some dangerous aspects to it, but it's a bit for better or worse. This is what we're having to do because architecture doesn't have a resistive bubble anymore like we're the protectors of the real and sculpture is not and painting is not and but you know architecture is the last bastion of nowness and permanence it may still be that but in terms of the way in which you were supposed to deliver it uh, the snap of the finger seems to be more operative than anything now. I think the technology gives you a lot of power and uh, last uh, I think last 10 12 years I've been helping a lot of customers implement um, a so-called terminology, building information modeling, BIM, right? So they would ask me, uh, now that they have the power, they would like to model even the screws and nuts <laughs> or even the hangers for the ceiling. And it's, it's a question of how much you want to do. Just as you mentioned, I happened to look at a drawing of Fullerton Hotel. If, has anybody looked at the Fullerton Hotel here? No. It was actually a former post office, I would. Uh, say and uh, the drawing came from 1860s or 70s, right? It was a very old drawing. And it was very smart in a way that um, all the windows had the same design, but all the windows I would, uh, the drawing had just one cross, and only one bay had the detail uh, of, the vi uh, of the entire windows and doors. So obviously, if there was a change, they would just make that change in that one bay and rest of the bay which had the cross would mean that it follows that. So people were smart even then. <laughs> you know. mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that uh, once you have um, uh, technology with you and you just start to go and uh, do all sort of things to actually make your life difficult, it has to be kind of it's, it's, it's in your hand to actually think what needs to be done uh, just because you have the power to cut and copy, paste. Uh. Uh, you just go and do whatever you want to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. it's true. I mean, I think that if anybody would say anything about the kind of parametric world, um, someone would say, you kind of have to know what you're going for before you get into it. Mm -hmm. um, because obviously every condition and every initial condition and input it's still an idea that you kind of premeditate in a way before it goes into a world of iteration and manipulation. Um, so the, the tension to me between choice and uh, kind of pure power and technology, I mean, that's, that's a tension which I think is, is interesting, you know, on the professional side and the cultural side uh, uh, for, for everybody because I think everybody pretty much is going to have access to some, you know, pretty pretty great tools and already do, um, you know, right now. It's not a have and have not world like it was in 95. In 95, um, what, I had to spend 25 grand to buy one seat and one machine for, you know, uh, uh, high-end software. It's That's so interesting because you're, you're in a sense like if architecture can operate from the city down to a micro scale detail, part of what we have to determine with this 3D technology is where do we draw our boundaries? I, we, I just did an apartment in New York that every surface was highly textured. So we even CNC milled some floors so they have this like massage-like feel and we found ourselves uh, scanning this woman's knives because she was a, an avid chef and uh, building 3D models of the knives <laughs> so we could do a custom cutting board and allow her hand to reach down under the handle of each knife. And I find myself like, is this really the best use of my time in these <laughs> technologies to make sure that she can grab the handle of this knife on this mm -hmm. microscopic level on something that's never seen and spends 99% of its time inside a drawer? You know, no. So uh, in, you know, in, in the overwhelming opportunities presented to us, I think architects, one of architects' next questions, architecture's next questions is, where is our time best spent in a world where we can do everything? How do we choose what to do? How do we choose yep. to, to, to 
place constraints or boundaries on mm -hmm. what rabbit holes we go down. Mm -hmm. And there are some great tools today that I think architects can use, but um, uh, these great tools are not going to make everybody great architects, I would say. Mm. <laughs> but these are just tools. You still need to actually pu uh, put your thoughts and uh, process behind and make sure this tool actually sit in within your process to help you out rather than changing things for the tools, right? So I, I, I believe that's, that's the way to look at it. Uh, tools are there, and I think uh, there's, there are a lot of, lot of good tools available today that uh, help you to uh, do your work uh, efficiently. That, that's the worry, I know you have a question, <laughs> but like that given our power and the amount of control we have over everything from the design through fabrication and building process, we could be the generation that produces more bad architecture than any in the history <laughs> of the world. Absolutely. Don't end on that. <laughs> <laughs> Does this working? Yes, good. Uh, up to the audience, but, but to ask a question first, which is uh, there's, a, there's a school of architectural historians who see um, the uh, role of the drawing in the architectural production process as the moment when architects could assert power both over the client, because the drawing, particularly with perspectival drawing from the Renaissance onwards, could give the client a, a you know, more realistic idea of what they were going to get than before, but also to exercise power over the rest of the construction industry. And the drawing became this uh, instrument, um, this device, this technique that architects used to exercise that, that, that power. Now, that's been taken away by, for all sorts of other reasons. I just wanted to ask, really, whether you see this advanced form of digital technology as being a way of reasserting that, or whether it could lead to perhaps a, uh, a different sort of balance in the relationship between client, designer, and, and builder? Well, I think, uh, uh, to a certain extent, I mean, I think the, the question relates to the conversation about uh, this idea of expectation, where if we have professional capability to, let's say, um, uh, sit down with a project and, let's say, now have less fear uh, on the opposite side, uh, on the client side, fear of how much does it cost, fear of uh, not being constructible, more and more a kind of new and highly uh, kind of adapted culture. The issue is whether or not architects um, in the in the in the scope of things are uh, going to be more um, just an agent in a bigger process of let's say image making as opposed to intellectuals or public intellectuals or um, uh, people who can affect change as opposed to either just being you know seen as as uh, what um, set decorators or, or production designers or something like that because architecture is now a media. I think that's, that's a very um, interesting and important point because if a different form of technology allows architecture to become part of public discourse, mm -hmm. which has been very difficult, I would say, in the last 30, 40, 50 years, mm -hmm. uh, even if it's not simply that relationship between client and or contractor, but actually it's about a relationship, it's, it's about allowing people who, who, who are respected commentators or, or have intellectual status from other disciplines to actually make meaningful comments about architecture, because quite often we find that they try, but actually quite rarely succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we've been very lucky since Alberti, in a sense, elevated architecture from being a position of craftsmen like plumbers or carpenters to being artists wielding pencils, like you mentioned. The mm -hmm. drawing gave us the ability to be perceived as ma magicians, as artist magicians. So I can do these four or five lines and tell you that this is an unbelievable architecture and you have no choice but to believe me. because You can't see beyond that abstraction mm -hmm. into the thing I'm going to build. Mm -hmm. So we, in a sense, we've been lucky for 500 years, right? Mm -hmm. And now the world is catching up with, uh, with us, and we no longer have the ability to do these magic tricks. So for my office, we, uh, you know, I wish we still had that ability, but we don't, right? Mm -hmm. uh, everyone in the world has seen our magic. They know how the tricks are done. They're no longer going to pay $100,000 for four lines and a, you know, <laughs> little signature or something. Uh, instead, what we try to do in our office is use that as an opportunity uh, to use the client as a collaborator, but educate the client. Mm. Like I think instead of treating the clients as 
uh, people outside of the discipline with no knowledge, and us as the magicians, mm. and using the drawing as something which separates us. Mm. I think we've had the most success when we bring the clients deep into the process and tell them why what we're doing is significant and important. Mm. And more often than not, they're uh, incredibly happy with that whole learning process because I think any client that's coming to us obviously has some interest in architecture. Uh, and to be absorbed into that world in a very expert and one-on-one -on -one way, I think, is another thing which we're offering the world that maybe we didn't rely because we were relying too much on separating the world into drawing. So it's an opportunity to educate, which, you know, at the end of the day, can also be an opportunity to build. <laughs> Good. Would anyone else like to ask a question or make a comment? Yes. Hi, uh, Chris Barger from Los Angeles. A uh, question going back to your comments about the knife drawer and what was important to your customer and kind of the minutia for you. You're in a service business. You've been hired by the customer uh, to, for a commission. And where do you draw the line as far as the use of your time in this uh, you know, 3D modeling technology or just politely say it's a knife and let's leave it at that? It's, it, yeah, it's such a problem for us because you know, more often than not, especially when we're doing residential projects, we're working with a pretty high-end client that's used to getting what they want and they want certain things that other architects can't offer them. So in a sense, our whole residential uh, uh, part of our office is, is predicated on getting you know, very rich, informed, interested clients. But I think at a certain point, it, it may be best for the architect to say, OK, we're going to outfit all of your drawers and get someone to design your cereal boxes and how they fit in. But we're, that's, that's a craftsman that's going to do that. Like, I'm going to put you in touch with a carpenter I know who's totally advanced on digital technology and is going to give you all the surfaces and texture you want. But at a certain point, I think we need to say, this, this maybe is outside the scale of my expertise, and I'm going to bring in someone from another industry. So I think for my office, that's how we operate. That if we don't have expertise, I'd prefer to collaborate with experts than assume that I'm actually an expert in, you know, particular min minutia of wood grain and knives and... And, and that's what I should have done with that project. I should have said, you know, let's bring in someone who's actually really knowledgeable about kitchen design and has a really high degree of expertise with surfaces and hygiene. And, you know, let's work with that person if the client would have gone for it. Um, in the end, we ended up designing a whole bunch of really minute kind of microscopic level details. And I have a firm with 10 people, you know, and there's, you know, two people for two months designing the inside of kitchen drawers. It's... I would rather spend that time going out and looking for projects which are within our area of expertise than assuming we have a kind of level of expertise in something which we don't. I Thank think you. the same thing happens in, um, when you actually look at the construction, right? What I've seen is that a uh, very high level of uh, uh, some of the good contractors like Shimizu and people like that, they often feel that architects' drawings are not good enough for construction. They, in fact, have... I've seen where you have a toilet drawing from an architect and they have actually gone ahead to create another 25 drawings that would actually help them to put that toilet together, right, <laughs> which can be built. So obviously, uh, uh, I feel th uh, that's where the thing is what you would like to do, which trade should do what and, and what is there for me.